Welcome to an introduction to managerial accounting brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. This is the first of two short podcasts on decentralization and performance evaluation. In this podcast, we shall focus on the advantages and disadvantages of decentralization, on cost centers, profit centers, and investment centers, and the use of return on investment measures. When a business grows in size, there will come a point where it is necessary to divide the business into areas with different responsibilities, which are then under the supervision of managers. These units may be divisions within one site, perhaps into production and sales, or they may be split according to what they produce, or they may be split by location on different sites. Decentralization is the name we give to this process and to the handing out of responsibility to different managers. The process then becomes the opportunity to look at performance evaluation. There are a number of advantages to decentralization, and most large companies have followed this path. Unit managers have access to better information, to more detailed information, and so they are able to respond more quickly to any change in circumstances. Given a person responsibility and linking this to salary increases their motivation and will provide a pool for successful managers from which the recruitment to positions of greater responsibility can be made. For example, a number of large electronics firms make a variety of appliances and divisions may be split according to the type of appliance. Here the split is into a computer division and a domestic appliance division. There can be disadvantages to decentralization. A large number of small units could produce duplication of activities large businesses will try and avoid ending up with separate purchasing, sales and human resources departments for each unit. A second problem that can arise is due to what is known as empire building. Here managers pursue their own goals and these can differ from the interests of the company. This is referred to as lack of goal congruence and is a major argument for carrying out performance evaluation. Performance evaluation means looking at each subunit in an operation and considering two areas. First, how is the unit performing as a unit? Evaluation should be able to identify successful operation areas and underperforming areas. Using the process of incremental analysis, this will enable decisions to be made about whether to expand, invest or whether to close a unit. The evaluation of managers helps identify good and poor managers. What is being measured will be important. In a unit focused on sales, there may be a decision about where to place an emphasis, whether it be on total sales, retaining customers, or obtaining new business. Managers should only be held responsible for what they can control. This is an important part of evaluation of personnel. In the example shown, shift managers have control over labor and materials used, but only the division manager has control over overheads. A vice president in this example has control over the north and south divisions. The degree on responsibility here is shown as dollar values. Subunits may be grouped according to whether they generate revenues, incur costs, have investment activity, or have two or more of these activities. A cost center has control of costs but does not generate revenue. Human resource departments and maintenance departments are examples of cost centers. Profit centers generate revenues, so units with sales will have profit centers. Investment centers are areas where investment in assets occurs. It follows that a profit center will generate revenue and incur costs. Sales staff do require payment. Investment centers will also generate revenue and incur costs. 
This podcast looks at evaluation of investment centres and the use of return on investment for that purpose. The measure that we will use is obtained by dividing the income by the investment made. Let us see how this works. Grim Faces has two divisions which we will term classic and modern. In terms of income alone we find that the modern division has a greater income. However, when the measure relating to investment is made then it becomes clear that the return on investment is much better for the classic division. Using profit alone does not provide as much information. Since return on investment is equal to income over invested capital we should look at two other definitions. The profit margin is equal to the income divided by sales and investment turnover is equal to sales divided by invested capital. Therefore return on investment is equal to profit margin multiplied by investment turnover. Here we are separating the income earned from each dollar of sales from the sales made for each dollar invested. What do we mean by income in this measurement? The income for an investment centre is considered to be the net operating profit after taxes, sometimes referred to as NOPAT for convenience. This means that since income normally will exclude any interest expense, we must add that expense back and then adjust the tax expense accordingly. We also have to be clear about what we measure as invested capital. The measurement used is to take total assets and remove any non-interest bearing current liabilities such as NIVCL. The non-interest bearing current liabilities include accounts payable, taxes payable and accrued liabilities. They are removed because they are regarded as a free source of funding and so reduce the real cost of investments. Let us work through an example. The income statement for Sky Construction is shown. Highlighted are the areas that we are interested in to determine the net operating profit after taxes. We have highlighted interest expense, taxes and net income from the income statement. To determine the value for net operating profit after taxes we start by taking the figures for net income. Now we add back the interest expense of 1,750,000 but we need to deduct the tax saving which is 40% of the interest expense giving a figure of $700,000. You should note that the tax rates can change and we are using a figure of 40% just to make the calculations easier to follow. The result is a figure of 3,300,000 for the net operating profit after taxes. Now let us consider the measurement for invested capital. The book value for the assets was $17 million. If non-interest bearing current liabilities are $3 million, then the figure for invested capital becomes $14 million. To obtain our return on investment figure, we divide the NOPAT figure by invested capital. So divide 3.3 million by 14 million and we have a return on investment of 0.16. You're more likely to see this expressed as a return on investment of 16%. Are there any problems with using return on investment? Well, since the book value of assets is being used, then we are looking at historical costs and depreciation. The greater the amount of depreciation then the lower the investment measure is going to be. We can illustrate this by comparing two different centers within the same company. Blip Telecom has two divisions, referred to as Northern and Southern. The figures for net operating profit after tax are fairly close, as are the figures for current assets of cash and accounts receivable. When we then look at total assets, we see a difference. The Northern Centre has plant and machinery nearing the end of its useful life, so that depreciation is much higher. We have highlighted the depreciation figures for you. 
so the figures for total assets now show a much lower figure for the Northern Division. This will affect the measurement we have for invested capital. Even though the non-interest bearing current liabilities do not differ significantly, we do have a big difference in invested capital. Since return on investment is income divided by invested capital, we get a figure for the Northern Division of 0.39 or 39%, whilst for the Southern Division the figure is only 0.21 or 21%. Suppose we are evaluating the manager of a division based on return on investment. The manager of the Northern Division appears more successful, but the figure is being distorted by the depreciation of the plant and equipment of that division. The problem is that the manager of the Northern Division may be less inclined to new investment since it will reduce the figure for return on investment. This would lead to underinvestment at the division. Evaluation on the basis of profit can also lead to misleading information. Let us say that the cost of capital investment is 11% and a plant has a profit of 1.8 million from an investment of 15 million dollars. This is a 12% return. If another $15 million is invested, the profits are increased to $3 million. Looked at on the basis of profit, the manager boasts an increase of 66% profit. However, let us look at the position from the viewpoint of incremental analysis. This gives a profit of $1.2 million for an investment of $15 million. That is a return on investment of only 8%. This is less than the cost of capital so it is actually decreasing shareholder value. Evaluation on the basis of profit alone will possibly lead to overinvestment. This ends our third podca first podcast on decentralization and performance evaluation, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hobcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.